Uh, Simon Stevens, who I have just mentioned, Chief Executive of NHS England, is a man who wields great power. He also uh, has the ear of some of the most powerful people in government. It's all very well talking about the five-year forward view, but how do you implement it? Well, if there is anything we have learned from David Brent, uh, you don't just shout out an instruction that your workers don't understand and cannot carry out. So for the last few months, uh, Simon Stevens has been going to people like you and finding out just how you think these changes ought to be implemented. And here is a, a short film just um, showing you a little bit of what he has found out. We're more optimistic about diabetes care in the next five years than we've been for many years because the leadership of the NHS is really taking diabetes, both its prevention and its care, seriously. But we're optimistic about something that nobody else is optimistic about, and that's the, the economic squeeze, because we know that diabetes prevention and integrated care with people at the centre can save huge sums of money for the NHS. I am optimistic that if we do get the resource and the commitment to general practice, that we will see things start to turn round. And so actually, for doctors coming into the profession now and other colleagues, probably this is the best time in a generation to be entering into uh, general practice as a career. The introduction of a five-year task force which will map out the real deliverables for achieving parity of esteem for mental health uh, it gives me cause for hope that for the first time in a very long time mental health is at the forefront of NHS thinking. Drastic changes and more money, the medicine prescribed by NHS bosses to preserve the health service. The new head of NHS England wants GPs and hospitals to operate differently and says people should take more responsibility for their health. So the NHS, we've set out our stall as to why change is going to be needed over the next five years and what it's going to take. But the best way of answering the question, how, is to go ask the people who are going to make it happen. So Susan, what about staffing pressures? What's the story there? We've increased our nurses on the, on the wards a lot over the last um, three or four years. And we have seen reductions um, in pressure ulcers and falls and that kind of thing. So it has really been um, valuable and imp improved patient safety. But there is a, an issue about just being able to recruit nurses. And we've also got concerns about the inflexibility that just having nurse ratios has. I think that there's, there's something around the blend of staff you have and, and just having nurses as the input is restrictive, I think. You're a fairly small hospital. Do you think district general hospitals have a future? The only way that I think that we, we and other hospitals like us can really survive is be, be, becoming part of a, a network, part of a system. And for us, at one end there is having tertiary relationships which are very mature and sophisticated which means the patients can get treated locally, we can have tertiary providers that come and use our facility, helping us pay for it, but patients get treated locally. And at the other end, we have relationships with the GPs. And if we can do both, so that you can get patients treated in the lowest cost and environment, as close as they can to their own home, and you can get specialist support when you need it. All of this requires uh, hospitals and general practice to work together very closely so that we um, share information about the patients, we operate a very safe clinical service and we deliver care closer to home for the patients for their benefit. And I suspect that in some areas we may find that actually we can deliver uh, virtually all of uh, the outpatient um, services. We worked out that we could change what the front end of primary care looked like in terms of people accessing us digitally, we could change the back end in terms of um, bigger scale and also we could develop into things like community care so that some of the specialised services that traditionally were delivered in hospitals would be better delivered uh, close to the patient in our GP practices. The fact that they can get hold of us uh, relatively easily by phone means that particularly parents with young children um, feel much more confident in their GP practice. Before the new system we 
had to go down there and sit in the surgery and it was full of people coughing and spluttering and kids crying and screaming. <laughs> but it's so much easier now. The hardest thing usually revolves around relationships and making sure that people understand uh, where we're going. Most secondary care providers are keen to have less outpatient activity, but how does that work in terms of their finances? And how do we make sure that we don't destabilise a community care provider, a secondary care provider, um, so that they're, they're in a win-win situation as well as us? I think it's very important that when we talk about Devo Mank, that we look at health alongside work, alongside employment, transport, all the key uh, drivers of growth. One of the big challenges of all is how we secure uh, a fiscally sustainable uh, system of health social care over the next five years or possibly um, more. We've got to ask ourselves, do we need to do things 10 or 15 times? Uh, can we do them uh, once? We have to join up. We, we, we have to start to break down those institutional barriers between local government assets and NHS assets and other public service assets and start to address them as community assets. <laughs> Health Promoting School is one that views their students uh, in a very holistic way. We recognise that students have got all kinds of needs, not just physical, but really around their emotional health and wellbeing, because we know that that affects their attainment and their, their success whilst they're here. We've seen all the trends from the days gone old in the old high schools where it was chips and burgers and Coca-Cola. So I've seen over the years how, how it's changed and it's, it's good because you know there's a lot of obesity especially in Manchester and we have to get in, you know we have to be we hide vegetables in cakes we do chocolate and beetroot we do courgette jet ones everybody's happy we make wraps we put salad in the wraps and that way it's gradually introduced into their diet I could make or help make the uh, Countess of Chester Hospital the most dementia friendly in the world but what's the point if the community in which it sits isn't? It doesn't make any sense to me so we need to work not only in partnership with our social care colleagues but also our communities too. If we want people with dementia to live better with their dementia we need to support carers to care well with their dementia and part of that for me is sharing our information, sharing our knowledge. It's where people um, in Tesco's, people in banks, uh, in football clubs, everywhere is given a bit more knowledge about what dementia is. So Tim, you've been visiting just about every hospital in the country. What have you found? I found that everybody still wants the NHS to provide free care. I think people are very committed to the health service. But I think that having been around the country and seen the variation in practice, especially in orthopaedics, that in places there's unwanted variation and we're going to have to make some changes. We found surgeons having a go at complex work and if you're doing low volumes you're hiring in kit and we found costs for loaning kit for over a year on average across the country each trust about 250,000 but some trusts were spending 750,000 and if you just look at hip and knee replacement we found the same implant of a knee in one trust of £1,000 and in another trust it was £1,800 and that trust was doing the highest volume. And what's been very interesting around the country is that every hospital I've been to, they all think they're getting the best deal and they've told me they're getting the best deal and they clearly aren't. So huge amount of variation if we sort out, we could easily save I think that just in orthopaedics alone across the NHS, £2 billion over five years and I think that's a conservative estimate. So, you've seen the film. Uh, you also heard reference from Rob Webster to a survey which should have gone ping in your inboxes uh, this morning. Very interesting questions, I thought, that had been posed by the NHS Federation. Just a, a couple of the top lines, you, you heard Rob mention uh, uh, some. 85% of you uh, say it's really important for politicians to start telling the truth about the NHS. 85% of you worrying that financial failure is looming unless that kind of change that's been discussed in that film is delivered soon. 
so there are a couple of questions right there. Uh, what is the truth that needs to be told to the general public? And how will this change be implemented? And I could probably think of 22 billion other questions, but I'll hold off for a moment, because I'd love you to put your hands together to hear from the man himself, Simon Stevens, Chief Executive of NHS England. Thanks, Anita. Uh, thanks, Anita, and uh, thanks very much, Rob, as well, for what I thought were authentic and wise words. Uh, both attributes that we've come to expect from the NHS Confederation. It's been a year since we last met here in Liverpool and there's been a lot of water under the bridge. Rising demand, financial pressure, pressure a difficult winter. But if, like most of us, you work in the health service, you know that's not the whole story. In fact, it's not even the main story, which is an amazing story of daily acts of kindness by nurses and therapists and staff in towns and cities and counties right across this country. And, as I said on Andrew Marr on Sunday, also by NHS managers. We should avoid denigrating the critical work that NHS leaders play in the stewardship of this nation's most treasured institution and instead recognize that these are difficult times requiring bravery and courage, and that is how we are going to chart the course to the future. So I'm not surprised that since we last met, uh, public satisfaction with the NHS is in fact at its second highest ever. But we've also, as you well know, achieved something for the first ever time in our 67 year history. And that is that we, the National Health Service, have set out our stall before the British people and come together to chart our own destiny. Five-year forward view makes the case for the NHS, for the changes that we're going to need, and for the minimum funding to back it. Because I, for one, was certainly determined that this time round, in this election campaign, the country should not sleepwalk past these important choices. But let's be clear, it's not my five-year forward view, it's not the five-year forward view of the NHS national leadership. It is our forward view in this sense. The only reason it has the power that it has is because it touches deep into a consensus across the health service about how care needs to change and about the importance of doing so. And that's why we're winning this argument on both the money and the plan. And despite all the sturm und drang of a general election campaign, what I took away from the election campaign was that actually there continues to be, when it comes to the NHS, a deep-seated and settled consensus on the part of our fellow citizens about the necessity and the importance of our national health service. And that's what makes our shared leadership of the NHS at this critical moment in our history so inspiring and daunting and, yes, energising. Somebody pointed out to me that uh, rough seas make great captains. And I pointed out that they also make for seasickness and lifeboats. But uh, that's obviously not the image we have as we think about the path ahead. But let me be frank with you. As I talk to people around the NHS, trust chief executives, CCG leaders, patient groups, jobbing clinicians, I see two clear dangers for us as the leaders of the NHS in the here and now two blind alleys that together we have to avoid. First dead end, happy talk about the future without squaring up to the pressures of today, the genuine pressures on staff, on finances, on performance, as today's Confed survey once again points out. But the second, the opposite dead end, is kidding ourselves that someone's going to buy us a few more years of the status quo so we can put off the difficult work of care redesign for another day. Well, my job is to tell it as it is, so let's come straight out with it. We have got to take collective action now to sort out our immediate pressures. They can't wait five years for new care models to take root. But equally, we are doing a disservice to our patients and our colleagues if we think that we can put the future on hold. Falling back on the NHS's version of St. Augustine, Lord, make us better, but just not yet. 
I prefer David Bowie, who said, tomorrow belongs to those who can hear it coming. So yes, we need our eyes on the horizon and on the path that will take us there. So this afternoon, let's get practical and talk about the how and not just the why and the what of the five-year forward view. Let's move beyond the compass and start talking about the route maps. And I want to set out four concrete sets of actions that together we're now going to be taking. First, putting our NHS on a financially sustainable basis, not just for the next five years through the big value creation and efficiency program we're talking about, but stabilising services this year. Second, the next steps we're going to need to take together on our soup to nuts program of care redesign, care that's more personal, more integrated, more holistic. And third, changing the national debate, the terms of trade, the actions that government, society, the public, the NHS are going to need to take on health and prevention, and how we engage with our patients and communities in new ways. And then fourth, underpinning those three, a new way of working both locally and nationally so that the NHS is more than the sum of our parts and we come together to get those three tasks done. So first, let's talk about the money. Let's talk about putting the NHS on a financially sustainable footing. Starting with this year, I have to tell you that I see no likelihood that the NHS will receive additional infusions of cash this year, and therefore our task is to manage with the resources that have been allocated to us. That's going to require a huge team effort, and there are some things that we nationally can do to make that task easier across the country. One of the things we've got to get right is ensuring that there are, as we wrap up the annual commissioning round, honest and balanced conversations going on about the level of demand and activity, funded activity and capacity planning in each health economy across the country. Let's be blunt, that did not happen with enormous sophistication in some places last year. That is leading us as NHS England to having some sometimes uh, challenging conversations with our CCG partners about the realistic levels of uh, funding growth that are going to be required in activity uh, for next year, probably in the zone of 2 to 3 percent. And there is no right answer here given that there are legitimate desires to invest in new ways, but equally if you're the local hospital, uh, you look at the likely level of uh, patients who are going to uh, present uh, for your care and that honest conversation we've got to reconcile. So we need to use the next uh, several weeks to ensure that uh, those plans for this coming year are realistic and balanced. Second, however, as you will have seen uh, earlier this week, uh, we are committed nationally to supporting the collective action which is going to be required locally to get a grip on some of the big cost drivers that are out with the control of any individual institution. And Temporary staffing, as you know, is the single largest cause of provider deficits at £3.3 .3 billion of total spending last year, a £1.8 billion overspend against plan across the provider sector. And I would say three things about that. First of all, that is entirely understandable. Second, it is undesirable. And third, it is unsustainable. It is understandable because on the back of the Mid-Staffordshire, the Francis pressures, the CQC transparency and oversight, we know that we did not have enough nurses in some of our hospitals. And so a quick process of catch-up and recruitment with lagged new numbers of nurses coming out of training obviously produces this kind of disconnect. But we've also seen something else going on as well which is that it is a consequence of our not, as yet, having exercised our collective purchasing power in respect of uh, staffing agencies and uh, temporary staff and using that purchasing power to convert that spending into well-paying, flexible, permanent jobs. But it's not just that this is understandable and it's unsustainable, it's undesirable because we know that the quality of care actually is worse for patients when there is a constant succession of uh, temporary staff who don't know their way around the 
hospital, uh, not worked as part of a stable team on the uh, ward, and so we have got to take substantial action to manage hundreds of millions of pounds out of this overspending during the course of this year if we are to have a chance uh, of ensuring that providers uh, are able to square the circle, which we have got to do, between the quality and the access and the money for this year. And temporary staffing is just the first of a number of these areas where we are going to need to take this more muscular approach to using the NHS purchasing power. Uh, we've talked about uh, management consultancy, uh, Monitor and TDA, written to uh, providers uh, yesterday, uh, likewise to uh, CCGs, uh, but there are many other areas as well. So we've got to start with a realistic set of activity and capacity and workforce plans for the year. We've got to use our collective uh, muscle to ensure that we are making good use of the money and tackling the sources of deficits. Uh, thirdly, we've got to be thoughtful about the new asks we make nationally, and I'm really talking to myself and my colleagues at this point rather than you, uh, as that we make uh, in the course of the next uh, year and beyond. So I have asked, uh, for example, uh, Jane Cummings, the Chief Nursing Officer, to take a look at whether it would make more sense in respect of the new staffing guidelines which are being proposed uh, for various parts of the health service to instead remit that to uh, what I'm going to come on to talk about in a moment, uh, our new urgent and emergency care uh, vanguards and the work of the mental health task force, various others. Uh, so a different approach for uh, answering those questions rather than the more mechanical approach uh, which might otherwise have been in store. And there are other areas like that which it is incumbent on us, the national leadership bodies of the NHS, to get right. Fourth, we've got to ensure that we collectively deliver on our key public-facing uh, performance standards, whether that be uh, in emergency care, whether that be uh, elective access, the Cancer 62-day standard, and something I care personally enormously about, the new mental health access standards for the first time in a quarter of a century, writing the inequality, which says we pay attention if you need your hip replacing, but if you have adolescent onset psychosis, then you are on your own. We've got to change that. But we also need to ensure that the way we measure and interpret those important standards does not in itself give rise to uh, perverse incentives or unintended consequences. And so I've asked my colleague Bruce Keogh to do me a review of uh, particularly the RTT standards and also to uh, answer the question whether the Southwest Ambulance uh, Service uh, pilots uh, should be extended. And then the last thing I would say in respect of the here and now is that we all know there are parts of the country that are in systematic imbalance in terms of either their quality or the structure of their services or their ability to make the money work, and they have been in imbalance for years, if not decades. We've coined the phrase a success regime rather than a failure regime as a different way of having a structured intervention in trying to put those places onto a sustainable footing. And I think we have tested to destruction the proposition that in many of these parts of the country, um, more PowerPoints uh, a switching out or the revolving door of uh, hospital chief executives, uh, individual institutions, inspection regimes, uh, short-term bailout funding that is repeated indefinitely. If these were the things that were going to succeed in turning around these stressed parts of the country, they might have done so by now. So instead, and recognising that this may or may not uh, be the medicine that ultimately be, can be successful, but we certainly want to give it a go, uh, today, Monitor, TDA, NHS England, together with the Care Quality Commission, and supported by HEE and others, we are identifying, naming the first three parts of the country that are going to move formally into this new success regime, North Cumbria, Essex, and North East and West Devon. And the idea here is that we are going to collectively, both locally and nationally, bring to bear our full uh, range of flexibilities and say, what is our holistic diagnosis as what needs to change in this individual health economy, not just go and inspect individual institutions or set individual cash limits, possibly look at um, multiple year financial control totals for whole uh, health economies, challenge the clinical model, ask whether we're willing to be more radical in some of these places where the model's clearly not working. So 
I think that is obviously going to need uh, political backing, uh, backing that I uh, expect we will uh, get. But I think hopefully you will also see that it recognises that we get the fact that the existing models of uh, trying to sort some of these uh, knotty problems out uh, needs to evolve. So that was not necessarily the most uplifting part of what I'm going to uh, talk about this afternoon, although with hindsight you might decide it was. But um, actually, I think the reality is we can't uh, move on to talk about some of these broader themes without having addressed uh, some of these important practical things we've got to get right uh, for this year. But looking out over the next five years, we obviously do have a huge task on our hands to put the NHS onto a financially sustainable footing. Our argument was that we will need at least £8 billion in real terms by the end of the decade, building up on a phased basis to that uh, over the course of the period. That is, of course, less than the NHS has historically had over the post-war period, but it's more than we've had over the last five years, and it's far more than the rest of the public sector is going to be afforded over the next five years, and I believe that would have been the case uh, regardless, frankly, of who had been elected on May 7th, based on the uh, proposals, the prospectuses that all of the main parties put before the electorate. The fact is that there are enormous benefits to having a tax-funded national health service in this country, but one consequence of that is that our funding levels are highly geared towards the economic success of UK economy. Recognising, of course, that the health service doesn't just draw from the economy, but also contributes uh, to the economy. But given all that, and the fact that we're still running a 5 percentage point of GDP budget deficit of the country, we recognise that we have to cut our cloth accordingly. And if we proceed on the basis of a ramp up to at least 8 billion by the end of the decade, we will be a bigger national health service at the end of the decade, serving more people, doing more things, hopefully substantially better. So I do want to make sure we get our heads around what this construction of this 22 billion number really means. This does not mean 22 billion of cuts against our spending levels. Our spending levels are going to be substantially greater. What this means is we are going to be facing a number of additional demands over and above as a result of a growing population, an aging population, more treatment possibilities. And so the question for us all as health service leaders is how are we going to mobilise to create ourselves as much headroom as we can over the coming five years in order to do these extra things for these rising number of patients that we want to serve. So we've got to think about this, I think, in three major buckets. First of all, we are going to be increasingly needing to redesign quite fundamentally the way care is provided. That was one of the big forward view propositions. Secondly, we are going to need to focus much more intently and frankly get the country to focus more intently on the demand side, including prevention, moderating the rate of growth, not assuming that we can uh, freeze it or necessarily uh, reduce it in absolute terms. So we've certainly got to do those two things, I'm going to talk about those, but first and foremost we've got to make as good a use as we can of the £113 billion pounds that we already have, recognising that we are more efficient now than we were five years ago, and we are more efficient than most other countries' healthcare systems, and the Economist Intelligence Unit just confirmed that point. But we also know that we have, and it's a multi-billion pound but, we have substantial efficiency opportunities. We're still leaving money on the table. As we've just heard there from Tim Briggs, and you would have this from any other clinician in the organisations you work in, uh, we have tolerated, we have tolerated far too much clinical variation. We failed to use our collective purchasing power, not just in respect of things like temporary staffing, but more broadly, procurement, the work that Pat Carter is doing. We have done too much go it alone on the part of individual institutions with too much veto power for necessary changes. You heard in that film there from Susan Acott, the chief executive of uh, Dartford and Gravesham. So when I was down at Darren Valley, the, one of the fascinating things about Darren Valley, which is an incredibly well-run hospital with an inflexible high-cost PFI, which they have to manage around, 
Nevertheless, they are doing very, very well on most of their uh, performance goals, and they're just up the road from Medway Hospital. I'm not going to uh, say more than that, other than that uh, the obvious thought that forms in one's mind is compare and contrast. And so it was surprising to me, to say the least, given the financial stresses and strains that exist at Medway for a long period of time, to be told that there is this wonderful, only half-used pathology lab at Darrant Valley Hospital that they've been trying to persuade their next-door neighbours to make use of and save hundreds of thousands of pounds a year in the process of doing, and the answer has been nine danka. Well, how can we tolerate this kind of situation when we're facing the kind of efficiency challenge we've got and we want to use those resources better? We have sometimes been penny-wise and pound-foolish. And that's nowhere more evident than in our relative underinvestment in primary care, general practice. And I think that the case that the Royal College of GPs makes for investment in general practice, uh, sizing that as at least uh, a third of a billion pounds of savings in offset demand flowing up to hospitals in the short term, uh, is a compelling one. I think we have sometimes foreclosed the conversation about the range of things that are actually either driving cost or our efficiency opportunities for us, just because they're not within the narrow scope of the National Health Service. Sometimes they will require change on the part of government, but we should not shy from that. If we don't think that our uh, litigation system is working well, if we don't think that we are getting best value from some of the long-standing arrangements that exist in respect of uh, our procurement of medicines, if we think that there are alternative arrangements towards uh, education, training, and workforce development. Those are conversations we are going to have to have. So, the question is, how are we going to mobilise against this mission-critical agenda? Well, one way would be for David Bennett and uh, David Behan and uh, Bob Alexander and Ian Cumming and Andrew Dillon and Duncan Selby and I and a few others to produce a document that says, here is the answer, off you go. That would be the David Brent approach, as we just heard from Anita, and more delicately from Rob. The alternative proposition, and I'm not denying the fact that we do have a series of quite well-worked-up hypotheses about uh, where we're going to need to take substantial action, but the alternative proposition would instead say, look, for this to work, we've got to take action at three levels. There are some things that can only be done nationally. There are some things that can only be done at the level of individual organisations, but actually quite a lot of this is going to have to be a collective endeavour across the front line of the NHS, and in doing that, uh, we are going to need to have a structured dialogue to uncover what those possibilities are, debate them through, and so that's why I'm very pleased that uh, today, with the NHS Confederation, uh, with NHS clinical commissioners, NHS providers, NHS employers, the Royal College of GPs, the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, National Voices, LGA, you get the sense this is quite a long list. Uh, we are collectively committing over the course of the next four months to kick off a process in which frontline leaders, patient groups, other partners get to work with us on that conversation, converging that with the work that Pat Carter will be doing on procurement, converging that with the work that will be going on uh, behind the scenes, uh, on the uh, 16, 17 and beyond funding uh, through the spending review, converging that with next year's uh, planning round, the tariff conversations and all the rest of it, so that come the autumn we are able to, in what is then uh, midway through year one of the five-year forward view, uh, nail the game plan for the big building blocks of the efficiency which will uh, be sitting in front of us over the next, uh, what will then be four and a half years. So that is the way we intend to approach this task, while at the same time getting on with the big blocks of opportunity which nationally we can undertake. But I do think we mustn't fall into the trap of thinking this is all about the money. It is actually about a much bigger conversation about the kind of health and social care system we want in this country. And that's why in the five-year forward view we said, yes, we've got to put the NHS on a sustainable footing, backed by funding and backed by efficiency. But we also see that we've also got to respond to the need to fundamentally redesign care and get much more serious about the health of the nation. So let me just turn then to 
I mean, talked about the sustainability, the second of my four big points, which is around care redesign. Well, what's the big idea here? The big idea is effectively that our good friend Don Berwick talks about the triple aim, improving health, improving the quality of individual patient experience and doing so as wise stewards of our resources. But in order to deliver against that triple aim, we are going to need a triple integration in the way in which care is delivered in this country to make it more personal, more coordinated, more holistic. And that triple integration is going to have to be between the blurring of the boundaries between primary and specialist care. That's what we heard from Nick Harding just there. It's going to be the combining more of physical health and mental health, recognizing that if you're a mum with postnatal depression, you don't partition your care needs into some rigid demarcation. And it's going to have to look at alternative models for combining health and social care where that makes sense. So that's the big idea. As you know, we've uh, kicked off uh, on that journey. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased that the work that Sam Jones, Sam Everington, uh, with the first uh, 29 vanguards covering 5 million people is now well and truly underway. Uh, the bringing together of the primary and the community and the mental health and the social care uh, through the multi-specialty community providers, uh, well underway now. Likewise, the vertical integration, bringing together hospitals and primary and community care, places like Yeovil, Salford, Isle of Wight. And then, in a sense, one of the great surprises of this process, we all uh, had three days at the Oval, people a chance to come and pitch their wares in a kind of Dragon's Den type environment. And unexpected by many of us, some really fantastic propositions around how to improve the NHS offer in care homes so as to recognise that and support the 400,000 plus people living in care homes who often end up getting shipped off to hospitals as emergencies just because we have not done our bit in care homes. So in places like Newcastle and Hertfordshire and Sutton and Airedale, radical models underway there. And then within the last fortnight, announcing the fourth set of vanguards around acute hospitals with a particular focus, frankly, on trying to pick up the mantle of the Susan Acott type agenda. Do district general hospitals in this country have a future? I believe, for the reasons that she gave, they do. But for the same reasons that she set out, I also believe that they're going to have to be organized quite differently uh, for that to occur. And so the propositions we want to test in these Vanguard programs, and I think the application window is still open, and it's an incredibly, by our standards, easy application process, two pages. Uh, you could practically write it on the bus. Um, still the opportunity to uh, put your hat into the ring there. The point there is we're going to have to reinvent what the clinical model, the way the consultant groups, uh, physician staffing, interactions with general practice, new workforce models, hospitals and so on, together with these links with the tertiary providers. That's the agenda we want to get into. I think we're almost inevitably going to get into that agenda in places uh, that are in the success regime, but we also want to do that with a broader array of providers. So we're doing that. But there are some other opportunities that I want to mention today. First is that we are determined that in order to learn the lessons from the sorts of pressures that showed up across the NHS this past winter, we need to quite substantially redesign the way our urgent and emergency care system works. We know that it's pretty confusing if you're a member of the public. Do I call 111? Do I dial 999? Do I go to an urgent care centre with minor injuries? Uh, uh, you know what? That A&E, off we drop. And we've got to do a far better job of joining this up from the public's point of view. We've got to do a better job of supporting self-care. We've got to do a better job of ensuring that uh, for um, high acuity patients, they are being treated in centers where the outcomes will be best. Uh, in those uh, conurbations where that process has already begun, we see strong results. We expect further decisions will be made on things like the clinical benefit of concentrating emergency surgery in places like Greater Manchester within the next uh, month or six weeks. And so our ask today is any of you who would like to come play with us on the emergency and urgent care redesign in your areas, please let us know by uh, July 15th. And 
with my colleagues Keith Willett, Bruce Keogh, uh, Monitor TDA at CQC, we want to try and uh, simplify the urgent care spaghetti uh, into something that, when you put all the pieces together in a different way, produces a better offer for the public and helps us better manage the rising uh, emergency demands being placed on us. We also want to really finish the job when it comes to the reinvention of support for people with learning disabilities in this country. I've been very struck by the fact that if you happen to have a learning disability and you live in the top half of the country, particularly the Midlands uh, and the uh, parts of the Northwest, parts of the Northeast, you are far more likely to be stuck in one of the institutions that supposedly we were going to close a quarter of a century ago. We've done that in respect of long-stay mental health services, psychiatric asylums. In fact, one of my first jobs in the NHS uh, in the late 80s was doing precisely that, just outside Newcastle. We have somehow not quite finished the job when it comes to learning disability services. And so I spent NHS Change Day a few months ago uh, with a young woman called Claire Stiles, uh, who has a learning disability in her family. And they all were describing to me what has happened to Claire, having had multiple long-stay incarcerations earlier on in her life. Then they moved, they got a personal budget, and Claire showed me the video of her sailing in the Solent, utterly unimaginable earlier on. So without in any way um, defaulting from the notion that uh, many of the folks involved are deeply compassionate and wanting to do the right thing. The fact is we do now need to have a closure program for some of the uh, remaining uh, long-stay institutions and reuse, reinvest in better facilities. And so today we are inviting uh, 47 uh, clinical commissioning groups across the country uh, comprising about a third of the uh, inpatient uh, learning disability beds to work with us on getting those new service models worked out and launching uh, that said transition programme in their areas uh, later this year. So we've got to get serious about the sustainability. We've got a big job of work to do on care redesign. But health is what we're after. Healthcare is what we do when we haven't got it. So I personally make no apology at all for being quite lippy on the subject of how, as a nation, we need to be supported to improve our health and well-being. The H in NHS is health. And my hope is that all of you, as connected, influential, and vocal leaders in your local communities will feel empowered to stand up and start making these arguments to the country and to your elected representatives and to other people in your area about the agenda that we're going to set with Public Health England and with uh, the Department of Health and uh, with NHS England over the coming year and beyond. Not just on some of our traditional health threats, tobacco, alcohol, exercise, but also obesity. Now, I don't want to ignore the fact that tobacco is still our country's single biggest killer, 80,000 deaths, two-thirds of smokers get hooked as kids. But we have seen huge progress there. We've seen huge progress on a number of other public health threats, which tells us this can be done. What we have not seen huge progress on is obesity. And some of you may have heard me point out that as the father of two primary school age kids, it is striking, and I'm not just talking about my kids' friends, I'm not actually talking about my kids' friends, but it is striking that one in 10 kids when they start primary school are obese, not overweight, obese, one in 10. And it's one in five by the time you leave primary school. So as a society, as parents, we are doing something terribly wrong in terms of the way in which we are supporting and bringing up the next generation. And we know what that will mean. That will mean a rising tide of avoidable type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease and cancer, because we now know that one in five cancers are caused by obesity, not to mention blindness and 
amputations. So the question for all of us is, are we going to, as the National Health Service, stand by and get ready to treat uh, that burden of illness, or are we going to rattle the cage and advocate for something different? I fundamentally believe that's second choice is the choice that we should be taking. And so we have got to, I think, get a big national conversation going about what we do as parents, about what we do as schools, about the food industry, about reformulation, about the role of the NHS in supporting our prevention programs. And we've launched the National Diabetes Prevention Program, the first of its kind, uh, which I think will be the world's largest when we have scaled it. And none of this will produce a big health or economic payoff for us this year or next. But wind the clock forward five years or ten, we will see whether the fruits of our collective efforts, we did or we didn't, actually get serious. So my ask of you is, join the public campaign. Use the goodwill and the authority that you bring to this in your local communities to change the weather and the terms of trade on these issues. As we do that, we, as Rob, I think, rightly said in his speech, will be engaged in a change of relationship, not just with uh, patients, uh, but with carers and with communities. And that's the change of relationship that, frankly, I think we need at all levels in the National Health Service. That's the reason why, for example, in our mental health task force, I've asked Paul Farmer, the chief executive of MIND, to lead that for us in the cancer task force, which next month will be producing a route map for us for the next five years. I've asked Harpal Kumar from Cancer Research UK. It's why, in respect of our maternity task force, we've got a broad group of interests uh, chaired by uh, uh, Baroness Cumberledge. And in a way, this, I think, points to the fact that, given everything we're facing, and this is the, my fourth and final point in a way, it is obvious that the only way in which the health service is going to uh, not only uh, make do over this next period of time, but we're more ambitious than that, improve, is if we come together to do it. If we come together nationally, if we come together locally. Somebody was telling me a story the other day of what, or asking a question, in fact, which is why is it that Sony did not come up with the iPad or the iPod? They had the Walkman, they had all the components, but it turns out when you look at the kind of internal sociology of Sony, they were just too compartmentalized. They just were incapable of knowing what they knew and coming together to innovate. That's a risk we obviously have to avoid. At a national level, I and my colleagues are now, the seven national ALBs, coming together regularly with a national uh, NHS board comprising all seven organizations, and then with a national quality board, national information board, national workforce, prevention, efficiency, information, care models, acting much more cohesively and, I hope, coherently as we think about what the broad actions are that the health sector is going to take, to take over the next five years. And in fact, you'll be able to see all uh, seven of us, I think, uh, here on stage uh, tomorrow at 5.30 in the afternoon. So bring your tomatoes, bring your pears. Uh, we will uh, stand before you collectively uh, to describe uh, uh, superb alignment and working relationships. Um, but, uh, and I mean that. Uh, but uh, that's the similar ask that I have of you locally. Because when times are tight, the temptation is to kind of retreat, to think small, to pull up the drawbridge, and to focus on me and mine, not us and ours. And that is ultimately going to destroy the very energy that we're going to need. Because at a time like this, our scarcest resource is focus and management attention and courage. And our most abundant resource is the goodwill and the community support that exists, particularly amongst our frontline staff. And so I very much echo the points that Rob was making earlier about the need for a revivified approach to workforce and workforce strategy, uh, drawing on the strong leadership that Health Education England has been showing in this area under Ian Cumming. As chair of the NHS Equality and Diversity Council, 
I still find it shocking, and we talked about this last year, that we have this systematic filtration occurring uh, up the ranks of individual NHS organisations and indeed the NHS itself, including NHS England, so that we are not tapping into, not exp making full use of the expertise that exists from uh, black and minority ethnic, uh, nurses, staff, leaders, but other uh, so-called protected uh, groups as well. We need to become much more permeable, we need to become much more open to the contribution that a far wider range of people can make. We should clearly celebrate the fact that Whereas five years ago, 30% of our frontline staff said they had good communications with senior managers across uh, frontline organizations. That's now become 37%. That's good. But think about it. A third? We've got to do better than that. And so my conclusion, I think, thinking about this huge agenda we have for us, the agenda putting ourselves on a financially sustainable path beginning this year, the agenda we have to redesign and rewire the way health and social care works in a way that's quite different from anything that's existed this side of 1948. The huge agenda we have to change the public conversation about health and prevention in this country, I recognize it's going to be incredibly tough. And time is not our friend. But it's for a purpose, it's for a high purpose. And we've got three great advantages. We have a plan. The NHS is up for it, and we've got 54 million people of this country on our side. Thank you very much. Sincere hope is that uh, you continue to be lippy in this next 10 minutes uh, because we have an opportunity to ask questions of you. There are people that I fondly refer to as the paddle people among us. Uh, could you waggle your paddles? Um, and if you have a question, please find a paddle person, attract their attention, and they will come to you and we will ask a question. But just while that all sorts itself out. Um, two weeks ago, uh, I was at a, a, a conference similar to this, but for people who worked in community care, social workers and those who outreach. They, the, certainly the message that I got from them was that the cuts they have suffered and continue to suffer, uh, suffer have brought them to their knees. Now, you, in your contiguous care vision, are going to rely more on them, not less, and they are saying they cannot even do what they did last year, let alone what you expect them to do in the next five years. How is this all going to work? You can be a really good cog, to steal Rob's metaphor, in a broken machine. It doesn't make the machine work. So I think uh, five things, actually. Uh, first up, we do have to have a conversation about the funding available for social care, and that will obviously be a conversation that uh, government will have to address um, over the period ahead. That said, I think realistically, again, given what we saw during the election debate, I didn't see anybody offering to uh, lock in uh, the kinds of funding increases uh, in social care that uh, under ideal circumstances people would like. So part of what the health service has obviously been doing, including this year, is a £1 billion at least net transfer uh, via the Better Care Fund mechanism and so on. So yes, we've got to kind of think about health and social care funding together. That's the first piece. But secondly, I think we've got to look at smarter ways of uh, budget uh, blending, and that will be at two ends of the telescope. So for individual, you know, your mum, uh, your child, then we are embarked on what's called integrated personal commissioning, where you will get a combined health and social care personal budget. At the other end of the telescope, we are contemplating something really very significant in Greater Manchester from next April, where we might actually pool £6 billion worth of health and social care, covering 10 councils, 12 CCGs, 15 NHS providers. So we're going to have to have a horses for courses type debate as to how to get that holistic sharing of the resources, whatever that may be. Third thing is, I think we've got to do more mutual aid. And so the uh, discussion about care homes, um, it is the case that too many people end up being admitted permanently to the care homes because the health service is not doing the uh, rehab or the intensive support at the time that people are leaving hospital. And it's also the case that too many people are from care homes being admitted to hospitals as emergencies. So that two-way conversation. That's the fourth thing is integrated provision and some of the multi-specialty community providers definitely looking at how you blend health social care, 
fifth thing, workforce. You can't have a conversation about nursing just through the lens of the NHS, for example. You can't have a conversation about care assistance without thinking about care assistance, uh, career progression, and I think this idea which is taking currency of a new intermediate level of uh, trained uh, and accredited care worker between the care assistant and the graduate nurse is absolutely right. So I think we've got a huge agenda there. Um, for those of you, I, I don't, please don't think that people are walking out in disgust at what you're saying. I think it's just... We, they were so far so good. They were, very, they were, they were nippy. Yes, I take all responsibility. <laughs> uh, you might be hurrying to your next session. I have um, let them know that we are running late. I think this question-answer session, many of you will want to stay for. So don't feel you need to rush to the next session, I think. Uh, people, you know, the elves that work behind the scenes are going to move things a little bit later if necessary. Uh, questions? Waggle a paddle at me, people. Uh, there is a number three over there. Let's go to number three. Yes. Anyone got a question? It, only waggle a paddle if you've got someone who's got a question. Number four. Thank you very much. Hi there, panel. Um, I'll wave back. Can, That's fine. It's can you hear confusing. me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, my name's Akib. I'm a GP from Derby. I'm also the clinical director for the Out of Hours in Derbyshire. We have seen a massive increase in, in medical indemnity costs. Um, for GPs in primary care and mainly in the out of hours. We've had GPs being quoted um, from 8,000 to 30,000 pounds this year for in indemnity. That means GPs are leaving the out of hours. It means GPs are leaving the country. I can think of four or five doctors in the last few months who are going abroad. Um, I think the out we've seen a massive increase in primary care um, moving to, to the out of hours because primary care is failing. I can see that from the practices in our area. What are we doing to address the indemnity problem? Because I think that really is going to cripple us, especially in August when um, most indemnities are renewed. The quotes coming through now are just the first few. In August, we're going to have a massive, massive problem. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know the answer to the question, but I'm going to find out. And it sounds like that's the kind of thing that's probably hard for an individual out of hours co-op or CCG to sort, but perhaps collectively, uh, we could do that nationally, so I, I will certainly take a look at that personally. Um, stand up if you have a question, then I can see. And if you've got a paddle and you've got a question, I wave it at me. The lights are in my eyes. Number three, there you are. Let's go for you. Hello, uh, my name is Akram Khan. I'm the clinical chair of Bradford City CCG. Uh, my question is that earlier on we heard, and also yesterday we heard about the, uh, the amount of money which is being spent in temporary uh, staff and so on, so especially in secondary care. I want to talk about and ask you about primary care. A lot of GPs are actually not coming into general practice as partners or even salaried GPs. They are choosing to work as locums and they are actually demanding the sort of salaries that um, you know, they, they can get with the market forces. We don't have the mechanisms in place to be able to tackle that. Uh, can you say anything about how we can do that? Yes, I mean, I think we've got to do uh, three things to uh, help um, strengthen primary care. First is we've got to have a all-of-the-above approach to boosting GP numbers. And in respect of new doctors coming out of medical school, we have got to not only make it more attractive to come into general practice, but we've got to probably take a range of other measures to try and hit this goal that 50% of new medical graduates will go into general practice. We have oversubscribed GP vocational training in some parts of the country, in other parts of the country, east of England, east Midlands, we have spots, uh, parts of the northeast uh, going uh, vacant, while at the same time we are, um, uh, people are opting into uh, some of the rarer ologies, and if we carry on in that way, we are just going to reproduce what we've seen over the last decade, which is that the rate of increase in hospital consultants has been three times faster than GPs. That can't carry on. So we've got to do a whole range of things on uh, recruitment, retention, returners in general practice. We've got a 10-point plan with the RCGP and GPC on that. Secondly, we've got to get more serious about multidisciplinary working in primary care, including pharmacists, and we're going to be saying more about that uh, quite soon. And then thirdly, we've got to use the opportunity represented by the new uh, organisational models, the uh, multi-specialty community practices, the networks, federations of GPs, to help ensure that not only is the quality of care, the responsiveness to the public, but also the working lives of GPs uh, such that people are willing to sign on. So I think there is considerable awareness uh, that this is one of our 
must-get-right things over the coming uh, five years. You, you mentioned uh, that we should expect something on pharmacists. Is that a big announcement coming Whenever in the next Whenever it comes, days? it will be huge. <laughs> Tease. Uh, let's go to number six, shall we, over there? Someone Hi. Question over there? Hi, uh, my name is David Robinson. I work within the pharmaceutical sector. Oh, there um, you are. Your Good. comment around purchasing power uh, and how you fully utilise that across the NHS and your reference there to the procurement of medicines. I was just wondering at what level you're thinking about aiming that at and where do you see the industry supporting working with you on that one? Yeah, so uh, we've got um, a medicines optimization programme, which is a kind of joint uh, NHS uh, industry effort recognizing that I think uh, Keith Ridge, the chief pharmacist, has produced figures showing that maybe five to eight percent of hospital admissions are caused by uh, polypharmacy or medication issues. So um, a, a more um, sophisticated approach to uh, concordance and to uh, polypharmacy is, I think, a win-win. I think we will have to take a look at the way in which we approach um, innovative new medicines and as part of the uh, evolution of the Cancer Drugs Fund, uh, that's something uh, that we are doing. And more broadly, I think we will have to look at the extent to which we are getting full value from our uh, supply chain partners um, in, uh, in, uh, in pharmacy. Um, it's worth saying that Simon is going to be here for the full three days, so um, we have unfortunately way overrun out of time, if that is even a sentence in the English language. Um, thank you. Please join me in thanking uh, Simon Stevens, and uh, let's go off to the next session. Thank you very much.